Welcome back to Singapore tonight. Thanks for staying with us. Residents in Bunkeng are in a flap as they've been getting some unwanted visitors lately, bats. The National Parks Board has received about 600 bat-related calls across the island this year. And with the pandemic dragging on, some are worried that they'll pass on diseases, though NPARC says that the fears are unfounded. We have been studying our bat population since uh, 2011 and uh, we have not uh, detected uh, any zoonotic diseases in our bats. If a person finds a bat flying into the house, switch out the ceiling fan if the fan is on, that is to ensure the safety of the bat, uh, and then followed by opening the windows uh, to let the bat fly out. Blocks like these that are near fruit trees and water bodies tend to attract bats. To reassure residents here, Jalan Basar Town Council has pruned nearby fruit trees in a bit to encourage bats to roost away from the flats. But NPARC says that bats play a crucial role in pollination and in keeping the insect population down by feeding on mosquitoes, beetles, pe beetles rather, and moths. Now for more insights, we're joined by Dr. Sean Lum from NTU's Asian School of the Environment. Dr. Lum, thanks very much for joining us. Let's start at the beginning. Why are bats even flying and are attracted to fly into these homes? Uh, thanks, thanks, John. Very nice to be be with you this evening. It's a good question. I mean, don't, bats don't want to be in people's homes any more than maybe many people would want bats in them. But I think uh, uh, sometimes they could be just um, the trees are in the vicinity of homes, or some of these are young bats, not not very experienced, and and they fly, you know, in, into a home, uh, depending, of course, whether they're uh, a fruit bat, which use their eyesight to, to navigate, or an in, insect-eating bat, which which are uh, flying using a sound um, uh, sonar, basically. And so, um, it's, usually, it's it's really purely by accident. And then, of course, when they get into a, a home and realize it's not an easy, they're they're enclosed. They they might be you know panicked, and and so uh, it's a. Uh, it's just an unfortunate situation, I think, both for the person in the flat as well as the, the bat. And, but, but it can be easily dealt with, of course. So, so it has something to do with the proximity of where the bats live and, and where the humans are sort of interacting with them in a, in a way in their environment. What, what other areas in Singapore do you think might potentially face the same problem, Dr. Lum? I mean, are, are there specific residential areas perhaps that might be more prone? Sure. Uh, good question, Don. I mean, uh, you mentioned that, you know, there's, there's been an issue with uh, bats in the Bunkeng area. Um, I, I live nearby and uh, it, in some of these uh, more established estates, there are trees such as the sea apple, what's called jambu lao. They have s these uh, uh, fleshy fruits that bats are attracted to. Where I live, there's a, something called the tanjung tree also with these fruits that attract bats. And I actually st stand out in evenings sometimes to actually watch them take the fruits. And I think these are the areas where, you know, if your flat is near some of these fruit trees, the bats might uh, mistakenly kind of enter into a corridor and into a flat. And in most cases, the fruit bat will just kind of go in and come back out. There's a second type of bat, of course, that these are in insect feeding bats. And they will often sort of fly around lights where insects are attracted to. And occasionally they fly into uh, uh, homes and flats, either by accident or maybe sometimes just to roost. Um, and uh, this, this de depending on, of course, the resident, it, it might cause a bit of uh, uh, concern. Uh, so we know that the bats here mostly live in, in fruit trees and there have been suggestions, to, you know, saying, why don't we just remove the fruit trees from all residential estates, but I suspect that, that there may be an ecological impact to that. Yeah, absolutely, John. So, so in in the you know in the earlier in the report, uh, you had mentioned that you know people at national parks had said that bats are very important in controlling insects. These would be the insect-eating bats, 
they are important in pollinating uh, trees, both in our gardens as well as in the rainforest and also in, in forest regeneration because they take a lot of fruits and then disperse the seeds all over and that allows the forest to, to recover. So um, it, 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 bats are very important and, and in, in, in the same way, you know, I don't know if you're probably too young, John. I mean, in, in, when I was young, people would often, you know, young kids would take out their tonsils to pre prevent tonsillitis. I mean, in the same way, you could say, well, maybe we should take out teeth to prevent tooth decay later on in life. And, and, and I'm not trying to be um, facetious here, but sometimes the, it, 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 do we really want to kind of overdo it with the, the cure when in fact the cure might be worse than, than the actual, it, it might even be worse than just letting things be. So mm. the question is how do we uh, manage the landscape as well as our own you know, opening windows and and as well as our own kind of maybe views and attitudes towards the towards this wildlife to make sure that you know we can all coexist in a way that doesn't stress either the animals or people out too much. Mm, we certainly won't, don't want to do that. We don't want to take fruit trees or bats out of bi our biodiversity. But I've had plenty of bats flying into my apartment. Uh, and, but I, I, I understand that shiny objects might be able to deter them from flying in. I mean, is that true for a start? And are there other ways of preventing bats from entering homes other than just keeping your windows shut? Yeah, absolutely, John. So, so thanks very much. I, th I think... Um, you know, if you, if you if you look at all the people who have been rescuing bats, so acres, for example, they've noted that there's basically two kinds of bats. One would be the common fruit bat, and and these uh, fruit bats are the, you know the ones with the more snout sort of fox or dog like faces. These are so what you show there is a pipistrelle. That's a insect feeding bat. So these don't fly with eyesight, but something, yeah, so like this is a myotis, this is also an insect feeding bat. They basically fly around through sound waves. So they're not navigating by eyesight, they're, they're vibration. So something like this, maybe a shiny object really would be kind of, to, I mean, no pun intended, would be kind of lost on them. But, but the fruit bats certainly, which are flying more by eyesight than anything else, they're a, a, a shiny object may deter them there's a fruit bat there. That's the common fruit bat. But uh, so so it really depends on the bat. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it it doesn't hurt any to have a have a, a shiny object. But maybe the even in the case where you do have something, maybe the the pertinent issue is if they come into your home, what do you do? And you know, how do you yourself keep from being bitten by a bat by inadvertently uh, coming too close to it or handling it with your bare hands? And how do you keep the animal from being stressed out? And it may be even worse, just calling an exterminator to come deal with it when it, it could be dealt with in a much more humane and ecologically uh, viable approach. Mm. Well, important to draw a line under the fact that, you know, they are for the most part harmless and they don't spread disease. Dr. Lum, thank you very much for sharing that important Yeah, no, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Dr. Sean Lum from NTU's Asian School of the Environment.